Hey everyone! The last video gave us the scoop on the German East Asian fleet in World War I. This is the 15th installment of our World War I saga, so make sure to hit that subscribe button. By the end of 1914, the British Royal Navy had completely sunk Germany's East Asian fleet, leaving the High Seas Fleet stationed on the mainland with only one way out Wilhelmshaven, Germany. Unfortunately, the British Royal Navy had blocked the sea route from Wilhelmshaven to the Atlantic Ocean, leaving the Germans with no way to escape. As I said in my last vid, the Germans have known about this situation for ages, so they've been working hard for decades to build up their navy with the aim of breaking through the British blockade. Kaiser Wilhelm II wanted to have a modern navy by 1920, one that could punch a hole in the British encirclement. But when World War I broke out, Wilhelm II's naval construction plan wasn't finished yet. It was six years behind schedule. At this point, Germany's latest super dreadnought, the Bavarian class of warships, was still under construction, and the existing capital ships weren't up to scratch in terms of quantity or quality. However, what the Germans didn't know was that at the end of 1914, the British Royal Navy was in a bit of a pickle. One battle cruiser had sunk, Two were desperately searching for speed in the South Atlantic, six were being converted in shipyards, and the new battleships that had just been commissioned hadn't even had time to get their sea legs. In the end, only 17 battleships and five battlecruisers were ready for action, while the German high seas fleet had 15 battleships and five battlecruisers, almost the same number. It's a real shame that the German Navy, despite knowing their own situation, were completely unaware of their opponents and thus felt their strength was inadequate, so they never dared to take the initiative and attack. Instead, they kept sending small fleets to fight guerrilla warfare, missing out on the chance to really show their might. It was the closest the two sides ever got to a full-on battle during the entire war. On November 2nd, 1914, Vice Admiral Hipper of the German Navy led a fleet of four battle cruisers, four light cruisers, and a bunch of destroyers to the British coastal city of Yarmouth for a bit of shelling. Before the British fleet could intercept them, they withdrew, leaving behind 120 mines to block the port. On December 15th, Hipper decided to pull the same stunt and shelled Scarborough in northern England, killing over 500 British civilians. Little did he know, he was lucky to get away this time, as British Vice Admiral Beatty had led a fleet to surround them the day before, but the British command system was a bit faulty that day, so they didn't make it in time. How did the Brits find out about Hipper's actions this time? Just a few months earlier, a German light cruiser sank on the reef in the Baltic Sea. Russian divers, who were novices when it came to codes, salvaged the code book and semaphore book from the ship. Not having any encrypted communication equipment in the army, they decided to give this priceless treasure to England, who knew the code. From then on, the German Navy had no secrets in front of the British, while the Germans were completely oblivious, continuing their guerrilla warfare at sea like nothing had happened. On January 23, 1915, Hipper led a fleet of three battle cruisers, a large armored cruiser, four light cruisers, and 19 destroyers to attack some British fishing boats near the Dogger Bank and, of course, their escorts. But the British had a surprise in store for the Germans after they deciphered an encrypted German telegram. Vice Admiral Beatty led two squadrons of strategic cruisers to intercept the German fleet. The British had an overwhelming advantage in terms of the number of battleships, five battle cruisers, seven light cruisers, and 33 destroyers. Looks like the Germans were in for a nasty surprise this time. At 7 o'clock the next morning, Beatty's fleet stumbled upon an ambush in the sea southeast of the Dogger Bank. The Germans were right on time, which was always an advantage, and this time was no different. Five minutes later, the Hipper fleet arrived too. At 7 o'clock sharp, the light cruisers of both sides faced off, and it was clear they weren't friends. They opened fire, and the Battle of Dogger Bank began. The light cruisers on both sides called for their friendly forces to join the battle. Hipper initially thought they'd only encountered the British patrol fleet, so he led the Grand Fleet into battle, hoping to win big. At this time, another cruiser sent a telegram, saying they'd spotted a bunch of smoke pillars in the northwest direction, looks like the main British fleet was attacking. Hipper was totally overwhelmed, he was only supposed to fight a guerrilla war, not a sea battle. He wasn't ready for a big war. 
So, he did not what anyone would do in this situation, sent people to investigate how many capital ships were coming from the British side. If there were only a few, he'd form a battle formation and prepare to meet them. But if there were a lot, he'd send destroyers to harass them and cover the retreat of the main forces. Unexpectedly, Hipper didn't do a thing, but instead just shouted everybody retreat. And Vice Admiral Betty of Britain was fuming he wasn't going to let the Germans get away this time. So, from the flagship battlecruiser Lion she issued the order, full speed ahead, let's get in. The German fleet was retreating at full speed, but they had a problem, the old Blucher armored cruiser. This was the predecessor of the strategic cruiser, and it was basically an experiment. German intelligence officers had heard that the British were building an epic-making battleship with firepower and speed as fierce as the later cruisers. Little did they know that this was actually the later strategic cruiser. But they knew that the new British warship was much bigger than the previous armored cruisers, so they thought, if the British have it, we have to have it too. So they allocated 8.35 million gold marks to take the existing armored cruiser and build a bigger one, the large cruiser Blucher. The huge cruiser Brooker didn't quite get the concept of a strategic cruiser right. The armor was thickened, sure, and the firepower was fierce, but the sailing speed was slow. This time it slowed down the retreat of the fleet. All the warships could only sail at a measly 23 knots, that's 43 kilometers per hour. Meanwhile, the British warships were all new ships, sailing at a speed of 27 knots, almost 50 kilometers per hour. After an hour of chasing, the distance between the two sides was getting closer and closer. The gunners loaded the armor-piercing shells into the chamber, the turret began to turn, the barrel pointed menacingly at each other, the damage control team was already in place, the medics were looking back and forth, and the long-awaited battle finally began. At 8.52, the two sides were 20,000 yards apart. The Royal Navy's Lion was the first to fire, hitting the Grand Cruiser Blucher and setting her coal on fire. Another shell exploded in the engine room and the ship was soon ablaze. She started to tilt to the port side and slowed down even more. In order to save the Blucher, Hipper ordered all to return fire and the flagship battlecruiser Seidlitz opened fire first. The Germans mainly targeted the British front, the Lion and the Tiger, two battleships. Beatty was a born fighter who couldn't believe his eyes when he saw the German warships actually fighting back. With a few choice swear words, he ordered the fleet to go all out. Soon enough, a 343mm shell from the battleship Lion pierced the rear turret of the Seidlitz, and the explosion set off the ammunition, engulfing the turret in flames. All 159 sailors inside were killed, but thanks to a brave sergeant major who managed to unscrew the valve before his death, flooding the ammunition depot with seawater and avoiding a bigger explosion. The British were going all out, and the two sides were getting closer and closer. Betty, feeling like victory was in sight, ordered the ships to fire at whatever they could see. This caused chaos, as no one had been given a specific target. So, everyone ended up shooting at the slowest and easiest target, the big cruiser Brücker. This gave the other German warships a chance to catch their breath, while the Lion got a salvo of fire. The Lion got hit by two 305mm armor-piercing shells, one of which made a big hole below the waterline, causing the boiler compartment to flood and the speed to slow down. Beatty noticed the warship was slowing down and appointed Rear Admiral Moore to take command. He then issued an order to attack the enemy's rear, but this caused confusion as Beatty meant to have the fleet attack the warships in the German fleet that were walking behind the team. Moore's understanding seemed to be a bit off and he conveyed the order to attack the large cruiser Blucher, which had fallen behind. Hipper wanted to save the big cruiser Blucher, but the captain of the big cruiser Blucher raised a signal flag saying the warship couldn't be controlled anymore, so there was no need to rescue it. Hipper thought, well, I wasn't planning to rescue you anyway, and sped off the battlefield. Beatty was in the telescope, saw that the German fleet was about to escape, so he quickly gave Rear Admiral Moore a flag code to let him speed up and get as close to the enemy as possible, meaning to quickly chase the German fleet. But Moore misunderstood. He ordered the fleet to get closer to the big cruiser Blucher. Beatty was so angry that he threw his pipe to the ground, thinking how could I let such a fool be my deputy commander? 
he immediately changed to a destroyer, transferred to another battle cruiser to take over the command. After two adjustments, the British had command, but the German fleet had long fled, only the big cruiser Blucher was still floating half-dead on the sea. Beatty had to vent all her anger on the big cruiser Blucher and finally beat it like hell on earth, firing seven torpedoes and more than a hundred shells to sink it. The surviving German sailors had to jump into the sea to escape. At this time, the British destroyers came to the rescue like a knight in shining armor, but just as they arrived, a German airship flew over and dropped a few bombs. The British were so mad, like, hey, we're here to help you guys out and you're throwing bombs at us. So they decided to leave the German sailors who were still surviving at sea to their fate and drove away. Hundreds of German sailors were either frozen to death or eaten by sharks, and that's how the Battle of Dogger Bank ended. This naval battle was the first time British and German strategic cruisers faced off against each other. All the big guns were blazing away, while the German small caliber guns and destroyers were pretty much just watching the show. In the end, a German armored cruiser was sent to the bottom of the sea, a battle cruiser was badly damaged, with 1,034 casualties, and a British strategic cruiser was severely damaged with less than 100 casualties. The British people thought they'd won a huge victory, but the naval leadership knew better. Beatty said she was so disappointed he wanted to forget it ever happened. Everyone thought it was a big win, but it was actually a disaster. I had planned to sink all four German strategic cruisers, but we only managed to sink one. Lord Fisher, the father of the modern British Navy, said even more unceremoniously that Moore should chase down as long as he has a little Nelson's temperament, and no matter what the signal, the first principle in war is to adapt to the situation, and fools will obey all orders. The British were fuming, and the Germans were even more furious. The German Navy had been following a strategy of avoiding war and protecting their ships, so this huge loss was really heartbreaking. So Kaiser Wilhelm II immediately fired the commander of the High Seas Fleet, Ingnor, and replaced him with an old and sick but loyal Admiral Hugo von Pohl. Before Pohl took office, Wilhelm II told him, if you can't beat the British, don't even try. Pohl, of course, followed his emperor's orders, and during his one-year reign, the German navy only made five symbolic sorties. The Germans, although scared of defeat, had to admire their ability to learn from their mistakes. The Germans figured out that the key to keeping the Seidlitz alive was to protect its turrets from catching fire and exploding. But the proud and complacent British didn't get the memo. Instead, they piled their shells and propellant together in the turrets of their battleships to increase the rate of fire without paying any attention to fire control. This carelessness cost them dearly in the next naval battle. That's the end of the story of the Battle of Dogger Bank. If you want to hear more about the Battle of Jetland, make sure to subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for the next video.